This sermon is brought to you by Bloomfield Presbyterian Church, Belfast. To know Jesus and share his love. Our first reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 10. You'll find that on page 1137 of the Bibles in the pews if you want to follow along. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 to 17. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. But their zeal is not based on knowledge, since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart That you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, Who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Amen. May God bless these words to us. Now, Pamela, come on away. Um, Many people will know Pamela and will know a little bit about her. And many people will also know what a pastoral assistant is and what, uh, and what they do. But just in case there are some who don't, Pamela, tell us a little bit about both. Okay. So I have actually written my name down in case I forget it. <laughs> so I am Pamela. He's, Frank's quite right. Um, I'm married to Brian. We have three grown up children. Uh, and two gorgeous grandchildren. Um, I grew up in Glen Gormley, went to church North Belfast, um, and made a commitment to the Lord around the age of 13. Um, and the Lord has been very hard at work since in the sanctification process. Bran and I joined Bloomfield about 34 years ago, so certainly we've been knocking around for quite a while. Um, from work perspective, I have a nursing background, trained at the Ulster Hospital, that's what brought me to East Belfast, um, and worked in hospital community uh, as trainer in terms of kind of first aid, that kind of thing. And then in 2016, my parents became less, less able. Um, and I asked for six months care leave, which really turned into four years. Now, one, one had Alzheimer's and cancer, the other had vascular dementia. And around that time, the, the fifth commandment was very much in my heart. Now, not in a legalistic 
and kind of sense of duty and you have to do this. But to honour our father and mother. Um, and father and mother doesn't just mean our literal father and mother. It means those who are senior to us. Um, during the four years that uh, I was caring for them, um, I became a dementia community champion, simply to understand more what, what was going on. And alongside those, that background, um, the Lord had stirred just a heart for intercession for prayer ministry. Um, I completed a pastoral care course and counselling cert certification. So you can see threads, and there's threads in every one of us, and we can look back and we can see the Lord's hand in our lives, and we can see how different experiences, good and bad, have um, affected us and brought us to where we are today. And so, so, Pamela, when Elizabeth retired, yes. it seemed like a natural fit that you might um, uh, help in this way. Yeah. So, as Frank says, not a new role within Bloomfield. I've Elizabeth gone before me and the Reverend Norman Duncan, both big shoes to fill. I bumped into Geoffrey Blue at Assembly Buildings last Tuesday and he said, ah, the new Elizabeth. <laughs> and the, <laughs> the, the picture that popped into my head was Doctor Who. I don't like Doctor Who, but the one thing I do know is every time there's a change of doctor, there's this kind of morph into uh, something different. And that, that's kind of the image was in my head. Um, and each doctor has its own characteristics. So some had a long scarf and another had a screwdriver. That's about all I know. Um, so I suppose the job is the same, but what Elizabeth brought to it, what I will bring, I hope, to it will be slightly different because we are different people and the Lord has put different things in it. I think Elizabeth's hoping it won't be better than her and I'm hoping it won't be worse. So... <laughs> So all being well, it'll work out. So the road, do you want me to yeah, say a just wee bit say, just about just what we've... Just finally, okay. about the sorts of things that you do, that we do. Uh, in the hours that you have. Okay. So really, it's about coming alongside people. Now, we do primarily, I think our role is for those who are at home, who can't get out to church. So there are a number of folk that will be regularly um, visited. Uh, and then there's also a fluid. There are those who, who are at home for a while and who can't get out and who we need to, to come alongside and to care for. And then, strangely enough, they get in the train and go to Dublin. That's where some of them went, to see my fair lady. Um, <laughs> so, you know, there is fluid. Things will come and, and go, and we, we just follow that wave. One of the things that struck me this week as I looked at Psalm 23, and how often have I read it, but sometimes the Lord just lights up a line in it. And it was, you prepare a table for me. And then I read the next line, and where is it? In the presence of mine enemies. That table isn't in a night with a nice white linen cloth in the Galgorm Hotel of the Sleeve Donard. It's in the presence of mine enemies. And perhaps part of our role is just walking alongside people and it's the work of the holy spirit it's god's job this is his agenda but perhaps it's just praying alongside them and helping them in that moment to find the lord's table the new living translation describes it as the lord prepares a feast before me well let me just pray for you before you read to us from the scriptures Father God, you give gifts to people to be used for the extension of your kingdom and the honor of Christ's holy name. Thank you for Pamela and the many natural and spiritual gifts that you have entrusted to her. As Pamela seeks to give herself in glad service to you and to the church, will you please anoint her with your spirit, endue her with your love, and encourage her in her heart. And in this role of pastoral assistant, may she find great joy in every aspect of her work and grant to her and Brian a sense of your presence and guidance and care within their family in all that they do and in all you have called them to be. And what we ask is in the name and for the sake of Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so our second reading 
uh, Romans 11. Now we're going to work our way through the chapter, as you can see on the screen. Um, there, we're, we're taking various verses, so I will keep you right as, as I read. But we're still on page 1137 of the Pew Bibles. Okay, so Romans 11, verse 1. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. And we move to verse 11. Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will there be will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourselves to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, But they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Moving to verse 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in, and in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. For any who are visiting us today or for those who are new to our congregation, 
These past Sunday mornings, we've been reading large chunks of the New Testament from what is called the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. About 25 years after Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the Christian church was growing fast, and it was made up from people from both a Jewish uh, background and from a Gentile or non-Jewish ethnicity. The Apostle Paul himself uh, had been a Jewish rabbi or teacher, and he had once viewed Jesus and his followers as an existential threat to the historic faith. Until that is, he himself experienced a radical encounter with the risen Christ, and that totally and utterly transformed his life, and he dedicated himself to traveling around the ancient Roman Empire, telling people of their need to be in a right relationship with God, how to be rescued or saved from the destructive influences of sin, and start a new direction. Now, I know that that word saved has lots of uh, connotations in people's minds, and often negative ones. Uh, It conjures up, for example, some pejorative images, including Donald Trump's recent political rallies, which sport banners declaring, we have to save our country. But actually, this is a very precious word in the New Testament, not least in this letter, which Paul originally wrote to the early Christian church in Rome. The bad news, he explains to his readers, is that we human beings are lost. Since Adam, we have become trapped in a spiral, a downward spiral of sin and selfishness. The heart and mind is curved in on ourselves. We are broken. And instead of giving allegiance to the Lord who created us for love and for service, we've turned our backs on God and destructively embraced created things and our own selfish desires. So in the early chapters of this letter, we've seen that all humanity, of which we are a part, are hopelessly trapped and guilty before God, who is righteous. That's the bad news. But mercifully, that hasn't been the last word, because in these early chapters of Romans, we've also seen that the good news is that God has come on a rescue mission. We don't have to be lost. Instead of holding humanity guilty, Jesus came as Israel's Messiah. He gave his life as an atoning sacrifice for all our sins. He came to rescue or to save us. So as our representative human being, Jesus took on himself the just consequences of all the pain and sin and death which we have caused in this world. He overcame that by his glorious resurrection from the dead. And it's Jesus' new life that is made available for all who put their trust and hope in him. Jesus became what we are, sinners, so that we might become what he is, sons and daughters of the living God. And as the magnificent section of the letter, which we call chapter 8, says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. So that is the good news of God's saving work and it remains good news to this very day. The problem we now see is that in spite of the Lord Jesus, God's eternally begotten Son being of Jewish origin, relatively speaking, very few Jewish people in Rome had embraced Yeshua as Messiah. Did that mean, chapter 9, verse 6, that somehow God's plan had failed. No way, said the apostle. God has exercised mercy time after time after time to the Hebrew people down through the Old Testament era. The difficulty is, chapter 9, verse 32, that the Jewish people had a real problem with the idea that 
God had to send Jesus to be a savior. That implied, you see, that they couldn't attain righteousness by their own means. That, that hurt their pride. And that was a real stumbling block. Oh, says Paul in chapter 10, verse 1, there is nothing I could ask for, nothing I would want more than for my fellow Israelites to be saved. That is my earnest and heartfelt prayer. Because, after all, chapter 11, verse 1, I myself am an Israelite. I'm a descendant of Abraham. I'm of the tribe of Be Benjamin. I didn't exactly go looking for God, but he came looking for me. And then he says, God has not given up on the Jews. No way. He didn't give up on me. So can you feel the kind of yearning that the apostle feels, this burden to share the Lord Jesus? It weighs heavily on his heart. I'm indebted to Tom Reed, who the other day sent the elders a link to the BBC Two Inside Politics program, which featured two Christian politicians at Westminster, Tim Farron and Danny Kruger, who incidentally is Prue Leith's son, both of whom made an excellent defense of the Christian faith in face of vociferous humanist opposition. And, and that to me was a little glimpse of how Paul must have felt trying to persuade people and recognizing that blind eyes cannot see, deaf ears cannot hear, unless God does a miracle of grace. And that kind of uh, yearning is surely a model for us as well, concerned for the spiritual welfare of hard hearts and resistant wills, of members of our family or colleagues or friends. God is good. God is sovereign. But each of us are encouraged to keep on praying and sharing the good news of Jesus earnestly in the prayer that scales on eyes will be lifted, ears will be unstopped, and those who once walked in darkness, verse 10, may see a great light. So that along with uh, John uh, Newton, do you remember the great uh, hardened slave owner of the past, was able to sing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost and once was blind, but now I see. So the rest of chapter 11 then gives a, a brilliant illustration for the Gentiles, uh, Gentile people just like you and me, warning us how we must never look down on the Jewish population who haven't yet recognized Jesus as Lord. Uh, Paul describes uh, God's covenant family as a great big olive tree. The rejectors of Jesus are like branches that have been broken off, while the Gentile believers are like wild branches that have been grafted on. Today, as Andy and Sarah and Mark and Katrina and James and Heather have brought Jude and Luke and Miriam for Christian uh, baptism, the, the uh, Christian equivalent of Jewish circumcision. So as believers in Christ, it is a huge privilege to have been grafted into the covenant tree, to have received covenant signs of cleansing and new life and spiritual growth. But as yet, far too few Jewish people have come to know this salvation for themselves, this salvation found in Jesus. But verses 25 to 27, Paul calls out hope that one day, hopefully soon, the ancient people of God will yet be grafted back into the original olive tree. And that has to be our earnest prayer as well. Well, just before we conclude, how we might ask, how might we ask, do Jewish people from their Jewish background and people like us from a Gentile context, how can we come to exercise, uh, experience the righteousness that comes by faith? And so chapter 10 highlightly, helpfully gives us a threefold answer. And I wonder if you can see what these 
pointers are. In reverse order, chapter 10, verse 17. We see that people can come to experience salvation or Christ's righteousness by hearing the message of Christ. Secondly, by calling on the name of the Lord. And thirdly, by confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. So here then are the three vital elements which Paul highlights as indicative of someone as anyone comes to know Christ as Lord. How does it happen? One, by hearing the message of Jesus. Verse 17. The Apostle Paul had himself been gripped as a Jewish rabbi as he was dramatically and unexpectedly encountering Christ. And that in turn motivated him to be passionate to tell others that righteousness is available, a right relationship with God is possible for everyone who believes. But, argues Paul, verse 14, how on earth are boys and girls and men and women, how are they to call on the one they haven't believed in? How are they going to believe in the one they haven't heard of? How can they hear without somebody preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? So in order for unbelieving Jews or Gentiles to come to experience spiritual life, somebody has to tell them. That's step number one. People need to hear about Jesus. Thank God for those who told us about Jesus. Will you, along with me, be the people who will tell others about him as well? That's the first thing. People need to hear. And the second vital step necessary for somebody to come to faith, verse 13, is by their calling on the name of the Lord. And again, isn't that something that happened to Paul, who was previously Saul, as he headed along the road to Damascus in order to catch and imprison Christian believers? Who are you, Lord? He cried in Acts 9, verse 5. Who are you? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And we're told that something like scales fell from Saul's eyes so that he could see. As Saul called out to Jesus, so Jesus called Paul into his family of faith. And Paul discovered for himself that there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. For someone to experience salvation, there needs to be a calling out to him. And I know that many of you here have done just that. And the third vital step, chapter 10, verse 9, for anyone to experience salvation by confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, we are told you will be saved. When I was a child, and this is why it's so wonderful to have here this morning parents fulfilling their promises made at baptism by bringing their children up with the context of Christ's church. When I was a child at Sunday school, one of the songs that I learned there and never forgot is this very verse of Scripture, Romans 10 and 9. Maybe some of you know the chorus as well. This is how it goes. Romans 10 and 9 is a favorite verse of mine, confessing Christ as Lord. I am saved by grace divine. For there the words of promise in golden letters shine. Romans 10 and 9. <laughs> Romans 10 and 9. Now, there's a verse for each one of us to go away with and treasure in our hearts today. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. In other words, salvation rests not on me and my efforts, but on Christ and his achievements. It rests on the unshakable truth that Christ conquered death when he raised, was raised from the, 
from the dead. He defeated the last enemy, death. It's when we admit that Jesus is the Lord over our lives. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. This, says the apostle, is how you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. For as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. How many people, I wonder, have early in their life asked Jesus to be their Savior, but have never confessed him as Lord. The Christian faith is not easy believism. It is trusting moment by moment Christ in charge of everything. As the late, great David Watson used to put it, if Christ is not Lord over all, he is not Lord at all. The three steps necessary for Jews and Gentiles alike to experience salvation, the righteousness of Christ, people need to hear about Jesus, verse 17. People need to call in the name of the Lord, verse 13. And people need to confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead. No wonder the apostle concludes in Romans 11 verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments, his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's join together in our prayers for others. Father God, this morning as we have responded to your great mercy and goodness to us, in the blessings of this a new day, in the blessings of being together in worship, of being engrafted into your people, and receiving you through your spirit into our lives to help us have faith, and glorify you. Lord, we respond by giving back to you just a tiny amount of all the blessings that you have poured out upon us. Father, we pray that you will take the gifts that we have given here today or through other means and use them in the building of your kingdom. Lord God, we also want to pray that you would help us to respond to your grace to us in giving of the gifts, talents, and time that you have bestowed upon us wherever you may use us this week. Almighty God, we, we come to think of others this morning. We want to lift up before you those of our family and friends who don't know you and the hope and the life that you have to offer. We pray, Sovereign Lord, that you would, by your Spirit, soften hearts and help them to see the truth of all that you have done for them. Use us, Lord, in their lives. Help us to be willing and equipped to always give an answer for the hope that we have in you. And use us, Lord, through our words, our actions, and everything that we are to draw people nearer to you. Lord, we also want to thank this morning of the members of this family of faith here in Bloomfield. God, our shepherd, you know those of your sheep who are struggling at the minute, those whose hope is diminished, those who are besieged by the realities of this fallen and sinful world. We pray for those currently facing illness, whether in their own lives or in the lives of those they care about. Father, give them your strength. Help them to know your peace. We know you are a God who cares and who heals, so we pray you will bring your healing into the lives of those we love, recognizing that you know best and that your will and your timing is perfect. We ask that in all things your will and not ours be done. We pray for those facing bereavement or hard times. God of grace, we pray you will give them your comfort and strength. Help them to know the hand of Jesus upon them, the one who wept and grieved here on earth, but who has also defeated the powers of sin and death. 
Lord God, we thank you that you have blessed this congregation with so many children and young people. This morning, as we have been blessed in sharing in your sacrament of baptism, we want to pray for the parents and carers of the children and young people that you have brought into this family. We pray that you would use them to model and teach Christ in the lives of their children. Give them wisdom and strength as they seek to keep and fulfill their baptism promises made before you. And help us, Lord, to play our role in helping to raise these children to know and to love you. We pray that by your Spirit you will work in, the hearts, in their hearts and help them to come to know and to follow you and take the covenant vows made on their behalf as their own in your good timing. Sovereign Father, this morning we want to remember our P7s as they do or, or maybe don't do the GL and the AQE tests in these weeks. Lord, help us not to reinforce the world's destructive habits that push our children to see their value in success in this world. But help us to teach and remind them that they are made in the image of a sovereign God who made them for him and for his glory wherever he places them in this life. We also want to pray for our secondary pupils and our college and uni students at the minute, many of whom are facing exams and upcoming assignment deadlines in the run-up to Christmas. We pray you will help us to remember them often and to keep them in our prayers. And we pray that this will continue to be a time when they grow closer to you and not further away. Father God, we, we pray for our land at this time as we continue to live with no functioning government. We know those who work in our public services and the business community are really feeling the effects of this. Lord God, we also want to pray for those from our family and our community who are increasingly struggling to feed themselves and their families, to heat their homes, and to pay their rent or mortgages. We pray, Lord, that a solution can be found that allows our country to function. And we pray that we are open and honest and loving towards one another about our needs so that we can be a family of faith where no one is in need. Creator God, as our news this week has focused on COP27 and the narrative that our world is doomed and can only be saved by our own efforts, we pray that you would help us to think biblically about our world. We thank you that we can rest easy in the fact that you are sovereign, that our world will not end in climate catastrophe, but in the renewal of all things at the glorious return of our King. However, Lord, we also know that you have given us this world and called us to care for it and steward it well. Lord, we know that we have exploited and damaged our world in our selfish pursuit of ease. Father, help us by your Spirit to live lives that enjoy the good gifts that you have given to us in a responsible and godly way that points people to your hope and not to human fear. Ultimately, Lord, our prayer for our land, our prayer for our world, our prayer for ourselves is that your kingdom will come. Father God, in these times of great uncertainty, we pray that by your spirit at work, people will recognize their sin, turn to you, and find hope for their lives and for eternity. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to play our part in that. Lord, there is so much that we could and should be praying for today. We know you're a God who hears the prayers of your adopted and beloved children. And we ask, Lord, that you answer today the prayers of our own hearts, as well as these things that we have prayed for together. For it is in, it is in and through Jesus' name that we ask it. Amen. Thank you for listening to Bloomfield Presbyterian Church Sermon Audio. We're a congregation in East Belfast with worship services at 11am and 7pm every Sunday. For more information, visit bloomfieldpresbyterian.org.